Hi, DJ. Hey, DJ. Ready for today's show? Sure am. Must be hot. You guys are looking a little flush. That was a great hit in the softball game yesterday, Brianna. Thanks, I'm glad you came. It was really fun. I heard you were going to Carnegie Hall this summer. Yeah, you should come. It sounds really good. 30 seconds to air. Places, please. Where's Brayden? Wait, let me guess. At the library. Where else? Ready, composite. Composite. Camera two. Hold up, where's Brayden? Push in two. Ready, key. Push to. Camera has speed. Action. Welcome to Focus Factor, the show by students for students. Today's focus is wastewater treatment. Find out what made it so dangerous to walk the old streets of Rome. Take a tour of our local wastewater treatment plant. Ride a boat down one of California's largest freshwater sources. Meet the team that reuses some of the waste and puts it to good use. And visit a wildlife preserve right in our own backyard. All this next on Focus Factor. Water, the one thing that all living things need to survive. We build our homes and cities near it and use it for transportation and entertainment. We use it to catch food, cook food, wash our clothes and ourselves, and we drink it. The average family uses about one gallon of water per minute. That's over 1,400 gallons of water per day. That's enough water to fill your tub all the way up to the ceiling. Hey, turn off the water. Now that's a lot of water. We have to conserve so that there's always enough for everyone to use. But there's another reason. A byproduct from using all this water is called wastewater. Wastewater is all the extra, dirty, used, leftover water that goes down the drain. It's wasted. Today, we're lucky to have wastewater treatment plants to take care of all of our extra water. But it hasn't always been that way. We wanted to know what they used before they had the complex sewer system. So we sent Brayden to the library to do a little research. Brayden? Brayden? Boy, they're not going to believe this. <laughs> Try us. Oh, hi. I've just found so many interesting facts. I made this timeline to help us show the important discoveries and inventions that have taken place throughout history. Let's ask Lisa to help us. Lissa? Hello, Brayden. How can I help you today? Can you please post this timeline? I'd be glad to. To find the oldest discovery of the primitive wastewater systems, we have to go back in time to 3200 BC. That's over 5,000 years ago. On the Orkney Islands north of Scotland, in the Stone Age village of the Scot of Bray, stone huts were found that had beds, shelves, dressers, and sideboards, all made of stone. They also had primitive drains that led from holes in the wall that might have been latrines. That's another word for toilet. The first evidence of indoor bathing and plumbing was discovered in the ruins of the Mohenjo-Daro in the area that is now Pakistan. Rain and this well may have supplied the water to fill the Great Bath. The bath was built with bricks, gypsum plaster, and bitumen, which is a natural tar that kept it from leaking. It's believed that this tank was used for special religious functions. But for personal bathing, almost every house had its own bathroom. The dirty water went out through brick pipes and emptied into the city drain system in the street. Covered openings let workers in to fix the problems in the brick-lined street drains. The drains dumped the wastewater into the Indus River. 
Unfortunately, when the civilization died out several hundred years later, this early engineering disappeared too. Many different cultures use similar ways to dispose of wastewater, from cooking, washing, and bathrooms. In Rome, only a few homes had pipes to carry the sewer water from their buildings. Most citizens just dumped their waste right to the streets. Look out! Ew. Street cleaners washed the waste into a large trench that eventually dumped into the Tiber River. Since most people didn't have private bathrooms, they had public latrines. Citizens would pay to use the co-ed facilities. It was a popular place to hang out, gossip, plan parties, discuss politics, and make business deals. In Britain, the street trains became blocked so often the government had to hire rakers or gong farmers to remove the wastewater. They sold it to farmers for fertilizer. Guess you could call them the first plumbers. <laughs> Problems with dumping pots happened so often they had to pass laws to protect people. Rome passed a law that allowed people to sue if they got hurt having a pot poured on their head. Cesspools back then were big holes for holding wastewater, but they overflowed when they didn't get emptied. So the mayor of London created a rule that cesspools had to be at least two and a half feet from the next door neighbor's house. King Francois I ordered property owners to build cesspools for each new house. Cesspool cleaners collected and dumped the waste outside the city. Rent was collected to pay for this service, and if they didn't pay, their house was taken. But even with all these rules and attempts to dispose of wastewater, most of the waste from cities was still dumped into the rivers and streams. As populations grew, the fresh water supply became more and more polluted. Waste and garbage in the streets caused problems too. In 1665, the Great Plague, caused by huge rat population, hit London. People started getting sick and dying, and they didn't know why. 60,000 people died in six months. It was so terrible, they wrote a poem about it. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, a chew, a chew, all fall down. The sickness was called the bubonic plague. It caused spots with red rings around them. People started carrying posies or fragrant flowers close to their faces because they thought the smell was making them sick. As they grew worse, they would sneeze and fall down. People in many countries got sick because of polluted water too. For many years, Dr. John Snow of England suspected polluted drinking water was causing sickness. Then, in 1854, during an outbreak of cholera, he convinced community leaders to let him remove the handle of an effective water pump, saving hundreds of lives. Even after this important discovery, it was another 40 years until we started cleaning the wastewater before putting it back into our rivers. And that was only in the large cities. In 1952, Oil floating on top of one of the worst polluted rivers, the Cuyahoga River, in Cleveland, Ohio, caught fire. This happened more than once, so they called it the Burning River. This sparked the United States Clean Water Act of 1972. This law said that by 1975, all dumping of raw wastewater into any river or stream had to stop. Cities had to clean it or treat it before returning it to any river. I bet that law is one that started everyone thinking about how they can help keep our environment clean. Thanks, Brayden. Good job. I didn't realize it wasn't that long ago we started using treatment plants. We've sure made a lot of progress since 1975, and I think that you'll see that some of our current ways for collecting and treating wastewater are a lot similar to our old ways. how this wastewater treatment works, let's start our journey at the source, your house. I still don't know how she does that. <laughs> you know, the water you use goes down here, 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 and here. But where the water goes after that has been a mystery until now. 
pipes that come from your house are underground. They empty into larger pipes in the street. And those pipes dump into bigger pipes that transport the wastewater to the treatment plant. Controlling the flow of wastewater is a lot like conducting an orchestra. It's great when everything flows smoothly, but sometimes people put things down their drains that clog up their systems. We'll be right back after this message. Mrs. Cunningham loves a clean kitchen, but improperly disposing fats, oils, and grease down the drain can unleash the clog! The clog is created by fats, oils, and grease, which can wreak havoc on your home and neighborhood, clogging your plumbing and our sewers. The result? Costly repairs. Citizens, rid yourself of the clog. Pour grease into a disposable container and put food scraps in the trash. A message from Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District. Right. No grease down the drain. Brianna is here to show us why. She also has a list of other things that shouldn't go down the drain. Brianna? Have you ever seen what a clogged pipe looks like? Let's follow this special camera underground into the pipes and see. When the grease hits the cold water, it clumps up and sticks to the pipe. It stops the water and everything else from getting through. This can cause a backup, maybe even back in your house. Yuck! There are other things that shouldn't be put down the sewer system. Like prescription drugs, thermometers and thermostats that have mercury in them, oil from your car, unused paint and paint cans, pesticides and fertilizers used on your lawn and garden, and old lab equipment or chemicals used in schools. The oil can be put out on trash pickup day, but the best way to get rid of the rest of this stuff is to pack it up and take it to your local hazardous waste facility. They know how to take care of it the right way. Some of these chemicals can't get cleaned out in the treatment process and can end up in our rivers and streams. Thanks, Brianna. If you're done popping around and directing traffic, maybe you can fill us in on how the treatment process works. I'm done, but remember those big pipes I was telling you about? Well, some of them are even big enough to walk through <laughs> and can carry over 165 million gallons of wastewater to this treatment plant every day. First, the wastewater flows through these bar screen machines that remove large stuff like branches and trash. Next, the screened water goes into a primary settling tank where most of the remaining solids, sand, and gravel fall to the bottom and are removed. Liz, we have a calling question from a viewer. Go ahead, caller. Hi, Liz. With all that dirty water out there, doesn't it stink? Good question. No, it actually doesn't. The primary tanks where this first cleaning happens are covered and vented. The air that comes out of the vents is sprayed with a mist of water first. This actually washes the air before it comes out. Thanks for the question. After the primary tanks, the wastewater goes into an oxygen tank where it is then mixed with 98% pure oxygen. In the water, there are lots of little organisms that you can't see without looking through a microscope. The oxygen and mixing makes them hungry, so they eat leftovers in the water and get fat. This helps clean the water. Next, the water goes to a second set of settling tanks. The fat microorganisms sink to the bottom, and the cleaner wastewater flows out over the top. There's one more cleaning step that has to happen before the water can go back to the river. Chlorine is added to kill any bad germs that are left, but the chlorine can't stay in the water because it could hurt plants, fish, or animals that live in or near the river. So sulfur dioxide is added to neutralize the chlorine. Make the water safe. That's probably the same type of chemical that I use in my fish tank. Probably. And I bet you test your fish tank water too, right? Yeah, about once a week. Well, the river water also has to be tested. And since DJ is really into water testing, he got to go on a little field trip. Or should I say, water trip. We'll start our trip here, at the Wastewater Treatment Plant Lab. This is Mike Cook, Captain of the Guardian. Hey Mike, what kind of prep work is needed before we go out on the Guardian today? Well, we need to make sure we have clean containers and bottles, that way there's no contamination from other sources. 
We also need blue ice to make sure the samples are kept preserved so that nothing can break down before it gets here. Looks like we're ready to go. Okay. Can you take these for me? Sure can. Lab stuff. Now this is the Guardian. Want to come on board? Sure. Looks like we're ready to go. Let's go. What are you going to be doing out here on the boat? Well, we're going to be doing different water tests above and below where the clean wastewater comes out. Mm -hmm. So we'll be checking right here above Freeport Bridge and then about 500 yards down the river past where the clean wastewater comes out. We test for pH. Right now the pH is about 7.9 which is fairly typical of the river at this time of the year. Okay. And most of that's just from snow runoff. Mm. The other thing we have to do is what's called grab samples. And we have three bottles to run here. What we do is go about six inches below the water and then recap it. And those are testing for different types of bacteria that are harmful to people. go downstream now. Okay. All right, so what is it that we have to do on this site? Well, we're going to do the exact same thing. That way we can compare the differences. Is there normally a difference between these two spots? Sometimes there's slight differences. And I've got limits, so I know exactly what's a problem and what's not a problem. Oh, okay. In this case, there's no problems. And if you remember looking at the river, uh -huh. the water looks exactly the same down here. Yeah. And that's our weekly run. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Mike. All right, we're ready to go back to the lab now. Here we are back at the lab. Thanks, Mike, for taking us on the Guardian today. Thanks for coming. It was good. Have a good day. You too. Now let's see how these tests turned out. This is Hank Stevens. Hi, DJ. How's it going? Hank is in charge of the Water Quality Control Lab here at the Wastewater Treatment Plant. Hank, we got you some water samples. Great. Let's see what it looks like. All right. Let's go. So what's going on here, Hank? All right, well, we've taken a sample from the river, and uh, we're going to test to see what kind of bacteria exist in this river water sample. What is it that she has to do to set it up? She's transferring portions of that river water into these test tubes here for the testing. Now, the samples, after uh, Rebecca's finished with them, will go into this incubator, and they'll set in here for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, we'll take them back out and look at them see if there's anything going on. And if there is, then we uh, do some further testing with the samples to see if there's any uh, actual bacteria in here that might be a uh, health hazard. Okay. So what is it that he's doing right now? That's a pH test. He's putting in uh, pH probes into the sample and stirring it so that it's getting circulation in there. So what would be like a correct pH uh, level for the water? Well, river water uh, generally is a pH of seven or above, which is about normal. Let's go ahead and move across on the other side of the lab. All right, sounds good. So what is it that we have to do over here, Hank? Uh, well, Tony's got the sample on an uh, instrument here that's going to measure turbidity on the river water. And uh, what he's going to do is take a little bit of this sample out of the bottle and put it in a smaller bottle and put it in a meter that will measure how much clarity there is in the water. So very muddy water would be very turbid. Okay. And drinking water would be very clean. Drinking water is generally somewhere less than one. It looks like this one's about 7.8. Uh, that looks about right for this time of the year, DJ, and it uh, looks like we're finished with the testing. All right. Well, thanks, Hank, for showing us around. You bet. Appreciate it. Well, that about wraps it up here. I'm headed back to the studio the normal way, by car. I'll see you soon. Are you sure you don't want me to help you back? No, thanks. I got it. All that testing is really interesting. Yeah. I'm glad they cleaned and tested the water because they used some of that clean water for other stuff, like softball fields. Follow me. We'll work on that. Yeah. Keeping our environment clean takes teamwork. Engineers and scientists are always looking for new ways to reuse some of the stuff that comes from the treatment plant. This reusable or recycled stuff is called a byproduct. See this purple pipe? It carries some of the recycled, filtered water to local schools and parks, to water the plants, 
grass, and sports fields. Using recycled water is a great idea because we can keep everything green without using our valuable fresh drinking water. Remember Liz told us about the sludge and hungry little microorganisms that sink to the bottom of the settling tanks? That's usable too. The sludge is removed from the tanks and put into a digester. Together they create another byproduct called methane gas. The cogeneration plant next door buys the gas and uses it to produce energy. Electricity, enough for about 50,000 homes each year and enough for the plant to buy back steam to heat the digesters. Talk about teamwork, but the teamwork doesn't stop there. The leftover solids from the digester go to sludge lagoons. This machine sucks the sludge off the bottom of the lagoon. The sludge gets injected into the ground with these tractors and mixed with the dirt. But now a new teammate has joined the game. The Biosolids Recycling Facility. They take lots of the sludge and recycle it into fertilizer and soil mixes. And that fertilizer gets sold to farmers to use in their fields. Together, the treatment plant, cogeneration plant, and Biosolids Recycling Facility work as a team to reuse as much waste as possible to keep our world clean. Way to go, guys! You know, I never really would have imagined that waste could be put to so many good uses. Me either. So let me see if I get this straight. Food I eat creates waste, which is sent to the treatment plant. And some solids are recycled in fertilizer, which farmers use on their fields. That's right. And recycled water is used in some parks, which conserves our fresh water. You know, the treatment plant uses some of that recycled water for something else, too. To help out some of their neighbors. The birds. And fish. The bufferlands. On my way back from the lab, I drove past the buffer lands. Originally, the buffer lands was just 2,500 acres of unused land that surrounded the treatment plant. It created an open space between the plant and local communities. But in the 1970s, habitat specialists realized that this land could be used for so much more. So they began to transform the area into wetlands, grasslands, and streamside forests called riparian forests. It's taken a long time, but the wildlife is coming back. Now there are hundreds of different fish, reptiles, animals, and birds that live on this land in their natural habitats. There are over 200 types of birds that live here year-round, and many more that migrate each season. One resident is the burrowing owl. Habitat specialists were concerned because the burrowing owls in California were disappearing. These owls live in holes made by ground squirrels and hunt mice in the short grass to feed their young. But they had a hard time finding good places to live and hunt. So the habitat staff helped by making sure the bufferlands had enough ground squirrels to make holes for the owls to live in. And they mowed some of the grass short to make hunting easier. These chicks hatched here on the bufferlands. Hopefully, they will grow healthy and strong and continue to live on the bufferlands to raise chicks of their own. But a habitat isn't just about one type of animal. To have a healthy environment, you have to have all the different kinds of animals. Some are hunters, and some are prey. Food for other animals. A healthy, well-balanced environment is called an ecosystem. And the goal is to create an ecosystem that can live on its own, with very little help from humans. And that's what they're working to do here, on the bufferlands. Wow, we're almost out of time. But before we go, we just want to remind you about a few things you can do to help the environment. At home, dispose of hazardous waste properly. Prescriptions, old paint, and chemicals can go to a local hazard disposal site, and oil can be put out with the trash. Remember to turn off the water when you're not using it, and check to see if the shower heads and toilets are low flow. They use less water. Follow directions on lawn chemicals and don't use more than you need. Keep extra water from running right into the gutters and never put chemicals down the street drains. Lots of street drains run right into the river without being treated. Be proud of a clean environment. Don't throw trash where it doesn't belong. And if you see some, pick it up. Respect wildlife areas. Remember, the animals are part of our ecosystem too. Thanks for joining us today. And we'll see you next time on Focus Factor. Roll clothing.
drop the closet. And we're clear. Great show, guys. Roll credits. Good show today, guys. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. That's my closet, Really? How do you do that? <laughs>